Why are we still here? I believe it is what we aspire to do. We enjoy the fact that we are a school that's older than this country. One of the things most interesting about Friends School is that it's very old. That's a fact that I like to get out there and to have both students and faculty and alumni remember that fact and to celebrate it. There are some immovable kind of standards. So when we talk about things like spices or when we talk about things like meeting for worship, those seem to be the things that keep us relevant almost 275 years later. I know things are going to evolve and change well after any one of us are here at the school. But I do think it's important to show what are the threads that have maintained themselves over the years. My name is Terry McGuire. I was a teacher for 44 years, the last 31 of which were at Friends School. And for the last 11 years, I've been the school archivist. This is Wilmington Monthly Meeting, typically known as Fourth and West. The meeting house is the church, in a sense. This was where Quakerism really was founded in Wilmington in the early mid 18th century. William Shipley was a merchant and farmer living outside of Philadelphia. He'd come to America in the early 1730s. His first wife died, he married Elizabeth. She traveled around, she was considered an evangelist for Quakerism. William decided to purchase land, and convinced a number of his Quaker friends to move down here with him. They really began the creation of Wilmington. They started a very prosperous commercial enterprise, met at William and Elizabeth's house for a few years, and then created their first meeting house in 1738. After 10 years, the meeting people far outgrew this tiny little meeting house, and so they created another meeting house on this spot, and that little meeting house became the school. George Fox was a working class guy in central England. He, in the 1640s, he was beginning to preach to people, preaching that we don't need a class of ministers or priests. Each of us can have his own original relationship to God and seeing that there is that of God in each person. From the very beginning, men and women had equal say. They had business meetings that were separate, but they came to a unity on their decisions. George Fox had made a very strong plea to all Quaker meetings that they should start schools and they should provide their own children and neighboring children with basic education, reading, writing, and ciphering. So there should be not a beggar amongst us. And so they wanted people to arise from peasant status. They wanted them to be independent. He saw that education was going to be a step in that direction. In many ways, Wilmington Friends School set the standard for education. Many of kind of the buzzwords in education right now, we've been doing for about 275 years. Now that was something I'd heard when I first came here, that originally the school was for Quaker children and the poor of Wilmington. Frankly, we didn't have solid proof of it until we found, tucked away in a safe, almost 2,300 little payment vouchers that stated that so-and-so is allowed to attend the school for three months. Because these were poor parents, the school was going to pay for it, and they paid $2.50 for three months of education. Delaware didn't have public education. The bill was passed in 1827. The Delaware State Legislature specifically banned African-American children, black children, from education. The meeting was providing education for black children in Wilmington. It was the only place they could get it. Early on in this school's history, there was this eye towards innovation. We were one of the first schools to start kindergarten at a time when kindergarten was under question and under, under suspicion as to why would you do that. Most of the older kids got to friend school on their own. They walked. They lived locally or their parents drove them or took the carriage. Arthur Harmon was the director of transportation in the 1890s. 
up to the 1930s. Drove horse and carriage, they picked up the little kids and brought them to the, the school that was across from the meeting house. And then eventually they transformed it to a bus, but it was for the little kids. When the school moved here 85 years ago, in 1937, we had all these fields around us. They didn't have fields back then. They had sports teams going back to the 1880s, but they always had to play in someone else's field. They used to play baseball or softball in the graveyard. I don't know if you've ever seen a Quaker cemetery, but the stones are not upright like this. They're, they're flat. And the great um, abolitionist and Underground Railroad agent Thomas Garrett was said to have been first base. They moved because although this place was the country in 1748, it wasn't the country anymore. Um, they had developed a fairly strong athletic program, including for girls. The first girls athletic team was in 1922. Those girls and those boys wanted fields to play in. Allowing girls to play sports shows that girls are also interested in athletics. And so to take down some of the bias in gender at that time, I think is important. It's one thing for a school to adopt a program. It's another thing for a school to say, we're now gonna go out into the world and we're gonna show other people how to integrate it. In the 1890s, as we had become a college preparatory institution under the leadership of a man named Isaac Johnson, it was thought that they might introduce music. And so the school committee debated that for three years. And after three years, they came to the firm conclusion that they were going to rent a piano, not buy it, rent it. <laughs> so they, they moved into these other areas slowly and, and carefully. I have a profound appreciation for the heads and sort of what they had to manage in the life of the school at the time that they were heads. Heads who were leading the school at a time when there were world wars going on or at a time when there was just a lot of civil unrest in our nation and needing to manage the school. As they did with the arts and, and the things that were other than basic education, these were introduced very gradually. Having the first telephone, you know, there was one telephone, and of course it was at the principal's desk. And then there was the business of like, are we gonna have dances, you know? But they had dances. We were one of the first seven schools in 1947 to be part of the AFS program. Students initially just from, from Europe would come and, and spend a year here. Our faculty are consistently thinking about the world around them and the connections to their passion and instruction. In the 1970s, for example, one of our teachers created the Peace, Justice, and Social Change course that is still taught and relevant today. The coolest thing about the Peace Course at Wilmington Friends is the fact that it was designed with a very specific mission. And that mission was to ensure that there was always a course in our curriculum that would reflect Quaker values. While much of Quakerism has evolved over the years, the one thing that's non-negotiable is the idea of being a peacemaker. We were one of the first schools to institute a service requirement. Each person who graduates has to have done 50 hours of community service to some organization. They are able to touch people who aren't necessarily within their circle. And that's something else that I appreciate about the school. In 2002, we introduced the International Baccalaureate Program. It's a program that spans six subject groups, studies in language and literature, language acquisition, individuals and societies, science, mathematics, and the arts. Just over 10 years ago, we implemented our one-to-one -one laptop program for students in all three divisions. Uh, these laptops have become an essential tool for learning. Student, faculty, staff, and administrators all have the same type of device. Quakers think it is a good thing to speak truth to power. Typically, that's very much allowed. What we do is use the process of consensus, the idea that actually everybody in the room, everybody involved on a committee has some say, and we see that translate in the classrooms. Vision heads, when they're hired, there's a student group that will interview the candidates. When I interviewed for the headship, students interviewed me. Every student it's the opportunity to speak. Every student has a voice. Can you imagine a two-year-old having autonomy, understanding that I have a voice 
and I have people who are willing to listen to my voice. This empowers them, and I feel it's very important, especially nowadays, for kids to know that I hear you, I see you, and you're important to our community. Lower School does a great job at asking kids what they think, and we continue that in middle school. A teacher at a friend's school should be prepared to elicit a lot of ideas and opinions from kids because that's what they've been sharing since a very young age. There is no handbook on this is how you deliver Quaker education. There's nothing that says this is how you teach integrity. There are queries about integrity and all that we do and how we interact with one another. Well, when we talk about integrity and being your best self, looking at that through a seven or eight year old's eyes is not about these big ideas. For them, it's just telling the truth, making sure that you're doing things when you know they're the right thing to do, even though no one's looking. And having kids understand that our differences are something to celebrate. While we are limited in how much we can influence the world, you know, as a school, what we can do is we can send out well-informed students who can go out into the world and at least attempt to make change by giving them the head start by being able to understand these very complex issues. I love visiting our spaces for creativity, design, and innovation, providing our students and graduates the tools they will need to solve new and different problems in their futures. So I am hoping when our graduates leave here, they are looking to go out into the world to solve a problem. In what way are they presenting themselves as critical thinkers, as being world-ready citizens when they graduate? I think the foundation of what Wilmington Friends School is, it's about the people that this place turns out, turns out good people who will do good. Our commencement is its heavy focus on the students. It's always hard to say goodbye, but it is a joyful day. It is a celebration of the students and their achievement, an acknowledgement that they're heading off to something bigger and different, and we believe they're prepared for that. It is deeply important to the school that the students who come from Friends School have a commitment to the, to the community, to the environment, to the things that, uh, that Quakers hold valuable, that we graduate young people of integrity and commitment to things larger than themselves and larger than their own personal aggrandizement or, or accomplishment. That is not unique among schools nowadays, but I think it, it's been there from the start for Friends School. It's lasted so long because everything that it stands for is still relevant, and we do it well. It attracts people who want the best in their community. When you start with simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship, there's nowhere else you need to go. Celebrating how the school has evolved over the years, I think that's worth acknowledging, but also celebrating the fact we are still rooted in our mission. Members of the Wilmington Friends School family have continually refreshed and invigorated learning while expanding the effectiveness of the school. Their service to friends has assured that the school will continue to serve a world that is no less in need of its vision than it was at the school's inception.